Now, sometimes my recording. Oh, yeah. OK, so we should have. It should be recording now. Is that right? Yeah, lovely. So uh, as I say, welcome to the taster lecture for the BSc on adult nursing course. Uh, we're really pleased to be able to offer this today. And uh, as I say, this will be currently recorded and available uh, on the on demand site. So that's also uh, an option for you or anyone who wants to watch at a later date. So there are many, many different things that we could talk about uh, as a taster lecture, um, but I just wanted to give a flavour around uh, one of the key elements of our nursing course, which will be looking at both mental and physical health and uh, the idea of um, an adult nurse learning about both mental and physical health is really important. So I just thought I'd um, share some uh, slide sets and a presentation that um, uh, students would be having probably within year one. So this would be a typical year one uh, lecture style. Obviously, we have other um, teaching strategies and uh, different ways of learning for students. So it won't just be lectures, there'll be seminars and workshops and clinical skills, but we will have you joining us for lectures as well. The approach I like to take as a lecturer is to offer as much interaction as possible. So there's um, no pressure on those that are joining today, but if you are interested or able to um, provide some um, uh, feedback and comments and answer any questions as we go through um, or do stop me and ask questions, then you'd be very welcome to. What I'm just going to do, uh, you can see um, I'm I'm in a bit of a shared office, so hold on one moment. I'm just going to close the door. <laughs> OK, great. So I can't remember if I've said, but I'm Jess Mills and uh, I'm part of the nursing team setting up the degree course at Chichester. And uh, you can probably see I'm in uniform. I'm a registered nurse. I work in a local trust, uh, so I also work clinically and also support the education of nurses. So uh, any lecture that we provide should have a plan. Ideally, um, we would offer um, the slides in advance to help prepare a student to um, get the most out of their time when they're in the lecture. So you have the opportunity to read through, maybe highlight items that you particularly want to focus on with a question or also um, uh, develop your readings, often references and links to other resources as well. So as much as you can, try and prepare yourself for lectures to really get the most out of it. Um, so the plan for this uh, lecture would be to um, make sure you're happy with an understanding of mental and physical health and also illness related to mental and physical conditions. Um, look at what influences mental and physical illness, so why people might become unwell. And then what's the relationship between physical and mental health uh, and illness? So they are not uh, exclusive. They're often in combination and one can impact on the other. So looking first at the um, your understanding of mental and physical health and illness. So this would be an activity which um, you're very welcome to participate in. So it's first thinking about, well, what is health to you? What does it mean to you? Um, so what does mental health and physical health look like? And these are a couple of images that represent for me. Um, <laughs> something around physical health or mental health. Um, but what is your idea of health? So if anybody is happy to um, either come off mute and share or write in the chat your idea of what comes to mind when you think about health. So I don't know if, uh, Steph, you're welcome to contribute as much as anyone. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think health is just having um, 
a good outlook on life and just being mindful of kind of what you eat and you know a bit of fitness and well-being and just kind of knowing in yourself how you feel and being aware of that Mm, absolutely yeah and we've got a great comment get enough exercise and eating enough fruit and veg yep absolutely um uh those will not only contribute to your physical health but also i'm sure you're aware your your mental health as well so it is definitely um a, a combination of approaches that often benefit both um so yeah absolutely so it's this isn't necessarily um uh, a difficult thing to establish for you you probably know when you feel healthy and well and when you don't um so then looking at what is um illness um so i wanted to be uh i wanted to offer you some slightly less common um uh ideas around mental or physical illness so um on the left, uh, apologies that it says mental illness above it, but on the left, there's a range of different syndromes and complexes. So uh, you've got to decide, do you think it's mental or physical illness? So you're welcome to type in the chat. Um, so Stendhal syndrome, is that a mental um, illness or a physical illness? So let's see what you come up with. Okay, so one of your group thinks it's mental health or mental illness. Okay, so um, aptomophilia, aptomnophilia, what do we reckon with that? Is that a physical health problem? Oh, sorry, I'm giving you the answers. Is that a physical health problem or a mental health problem? I've purposely chosen slightly... Um, <laughs> <laughs> obscure illnesses but they're all known illnesses yeah, I've not heard of any of these at all <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I might say physical for the second one okay so um, just so you know a uh, syndrome is a way to describe a collection of symptoms so sometimes you have an, uh, a definitive diagnosis with a specific set of symptoms um, but sometimes the diagnosis is less um, well known um, maybe the symptoms are a little bit more diffuse they're not quite so easy to, to identify so a syndrome is a collection of symptoms so there's not just one single cause or one single symptom there's a collection of symptoms so that's what a syndrome is so let's have a look uh, at uh, where they come out so um, we've got basically half and half um, but I think like you I wouldn't have been able to pick which from name is a mental illness or a physical illness um, so if you're interested Stendhal syndrome is an, uh, a mental health condition where people develop anxiety um, uh, when they're exposed to art um, whether that's um, uh, drawing paintings or um, uh, other mediums of art so aptomnophilia is um, an overwhelming desire to amputate a healthy body part so uh, if someone has a, um, a misrepresentation of uh, a part of their body and they think it's maybe not healthy and it's damaging them, they would want to remove it, even though uh, to all intents and purposes it's healthy. Uh, Capgrass is a delusional belief uh, whereby you think that a close family member or friend, maybe your spouse, has been replaced by an imposter. So sometimes people think it's a robot that's made to look like someone that you know or um, a spy, someone who's uh, trying to um, manipulate you and you think it's uh, uh, not actually the person. And, and clearly, if it's happening in your own home, that's going to significantly impact on on that person's well-being. If they think the person they're living with, who sh who claims to be their husband or wife, uh, they now think is an imposter. 
Diogenes syndrome is basically um, hoarding, collecting random things and attributing uh, a, a, an emotional attachment to it. Um, so if you were to try and part that person from that item, they would get very distressed by it. So clearly uh, 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 anxiety provoking. So there's, they are rare, but they're known mental illnesses. And then um, physical illnesses, stone man syndrome, uh, that's uh, where your connective tissue, so that's ligaments and tendons and muscles, they, what's called ossify, they become bone. And so they stiffen and harden. And then that person's mobility is se seriously impacted. Hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome. Uh, so that's uh, a genetic disorder where the person um, ages uh, at an excessive rate. So cell, cells degenerate and they become um, uh, more obviously aging uh, in their appearance and also internally within their structures and organs. Agenes syndrome is a type of liver, liver disease and dandy walker complex is a brain disorder that affects the person's ability to move and coordinate their movement. Um, so a little bit of um, uh, an, a sort of fun exercise to look at what physical and mental illness could be um, and that you can't always tell just by the diagnosis. Um, but as an aside, um, this introduces you to some of the complexity of medical terms as well. And so when you're in lectures uh, and when you're um, working on your nursing course and studying, um, I would encourage you to embrace these words and terms. Try not, um, you know, ask about it. And lecturers will help you unpick um, uh, uh, specific words uh, and how you can bring words together uh, to, to make sense. Um, so, and then if you have a query, do ask. Um, so another thing to think about is you can't necessarily separate mental and physical illness. Actually, a person may have both, um, either separate conditions or the same condition ha has both mental and physical illness attributes or components. So dementia would be a very uh, classic physical and mental health um, uh, or illness uh, condition. Often neurological disorders have both um, mental illness and physical illness components. So although there is some commonality to uh, the experience of someone who develops uh, mental illness or physical illness, it is helpful to recognise that actually there are some differences and the experience of a person who has a mental or physical illness can be quite um, markedly different. So this is just a table which, I, which sort of compares some um, uh, common elements. So in terms of mental illness, the, the assessment isn't um, objective like it is in physical illness where you have a blood test or an x-ray or a, um, a biopsy and it's clearly identified as a physical cause um, uh, with, with, a, with a diagnosis. Mental illness is much more subjective. Yes, it, the diagnosis is undertaken by trained healthcare professionals, but um, how the person responds when they're being assessed and how expert the person diagnosing is can vary. Um, diagnosis therefore becomes unreliable, um, uh, whereas in physical illness it's normally reliable. We normally can be quite definitive. Um, interestingly, diagnosis can be culturally determined if you have mental illness. So not every country recognises certain um, signs or symptoms. And that's something that is becoming more prevalent, particularly in, in, um, in this country and European countries. We're no longer looking at diagnosis. We're looking at what's the experience of the person with 
mental illness. So rather than saying the person maybe has schizophrenia, the person is has um, is hallucinating, hearing things or seeing things. Um, so it's culturally de determined, you know, not every country recognises mental illness um, and therefore people aren't necessarily getting treatment or even coming forward with, with their problems. Whereas normally, whether you have a heart attack in China or a heart attack in um, uh, America, it is essentially the same, that it's consistent. There's something called the sick role. That's a key element that you'll learn more about when we look at the sociology of health, how people view health. So with some conditions, it's OK to be ill. That's what the sick role is saying. Other times, other conditions, it's not. And so people who have mental illness often face stigma and prejudice um, because they have a mental illness itself. Um, and then along with um, the diagnosis, there's treatment. And you're probably aware that some people who have um, mental illness uh, will require treatment, but it's not provided through them volunteering uh, and receiving the treatment. It's compulsory. So that would be sectioning under the Mental um, Health Act. Um, whereas generally in physical health, you voluntarily seek that treatment. And then finally, another key variant um, for people who have mental illness is that the onset, so when it starts and when it ends, is often vague. People can't necessarily pinpoint a direct cause or time, whereas physical illness, not in entirety, but often there's a clear point when someone wasn't physically unwell, they are now unwell, and hopefully, if possible, they recover. So when you look at it on the table you can see the comparison but what we would encourage you to do through this lecture and through the course is to really reflect well what does that mean for the person having that experience with mental illness and or physical illness what does it feel like to have an illness that um, uh, people would stigmatize you for having or you're not sure if it will ever end so will you always be depressed? Will you always have this level of anxiety? So our care as a nurse will be recognising that experience for the individual and helping support them through, through that experience. So moving on to the next element, which is what influences physical and mental health. So there's lots of different influences. This is you will you will see this more than once throughout your nursing course, because what it does is it it highlights all the different influences on whether someone is actually healthy and well. And it starts with the person themselves, their physical characteristics, uh, their genetic makeup what age they are, what gender or sex. So sex would be the determined um, uh, at birth, uh, whereas uh, obviously people can change their gender, they can choose how they identify. Um, individual lifestyle factors, so I'm sure you're aware and you've already told me, getting exercise, eating enough fruit and veg, those will definitely um, be um, lifestyle factors that you can either have to benefit you or um, that could uh, actually impact negatively on you staying healthy and well. So those probably are quite familiar to you, particularly in terms of physical illness. But what's really important to recognise is that um, whilst we can see differences in mental and physical health, health overall is going to be determined by many other things, more than just your genes. It is also the environment, that nature nurture argument. So in terms of health, you are going to be healthier if you have really supportive social and community networks, i.e. you have a stable home life, you have friends, you have family, you you have a community of people that you relate to, You're, you don't feel ostracised or, or isolated, etc. And that actually does change your, change your um, 
uh, outcomes in terms of health. And then again, at a broader level, how much money do you have? How well educated are you? What kind of work do you do? Do you live in an area with good air quality, um, et cetera, et cetera? These are, these are what will also socioeconomic environmental factors impact. And how you vote, you know, who you vote for, that is going to actively change policies as to whether that will support you or hinder you uh, in you being healthy and well. So it's big as well as individually eating fruit and veg um, uh, in terms of in terms of your health. But don't give up. It's there's lots that you can do yourself, but it's recognizing that there are other external um, influences that take a more take longer and uh, to, to change and challenge. But nurses should be involved in that. Nurses have a really powerful voice. We're trusted. So if we're asked for our opinion, then we need to use that that opportunity to help influence health and change for the better. Um, so apologies if this slide is not very um, uh, clear but what I'm just going to do because I think I can unfortunately I won't be able to screen share because I've tried it earlier and it just didn't seem to work but I've just put in the chat the um, the link to this um, uh, slide or this image of the slide and it's basically looking at life expectancy and at a very uh, crude level everything on the right of that central line whatever you're doing will increase your life expectancy and then everything to the left of that central line would reduce your life expectancy and it goes through you know some funny some serious a whole range of um, activities that you could do or stop doing to try and change your life expectancy so you're welcome to have a look at that at some point either now or or later um, oh sorry that's me clicking on it. You probably didn't see that. What we do know, sadly, is if you have mental illness and there's a category of mental illness, severe or serious mental illness, you, I mean, this is shocking. Uh, this is UK, you know, national data. This isn't um, in a developing country data. This is what happens in the UK. If you have a serious mental illness, so that would be something like schizophrenia or a severe level of depression, you have a significantly reduced life expectancy. We're looking at 20 years difference to a healthy person of the same age without a severe mental illness. So this is, to me, shocking. I don't know what your thoughts are. You're welcome to add in the chat what your thoughts are uh, to, to that data. Um, and so as nurses, we know this, this data now exists. So a responsibility, I think a moral responsibility, a professional responsibility is to work to try and re reduce that discrepancy in, in um, life expectancy. So finally, um, moving on to identifying the relationship between physical and mental health. Um, and whilst, as I say, I'm, I'm sort of separating them out, I would encourage you to recognise that actually there is a lot of interdependence between physical and mental health. So, um, a lot of, I've realised a lot of this data isn't particularly positive. Uh, and this is probably the most stark, but um, these are the four top lifestyle influences that will determine how quickly you die. <laughs> and these are what are called preventable causes. So you do not have to smoke. Uh, you do not have to have excessive alcohol and drug use. You can move, exercise, and you can reduce your dietary risks. So not having high salt, not having high fat, um, uh, not having high sugars, etc. So these are what we call modifiable 
um, lifestyle factors that if you um, if you reduce uh, or improve your physical activity or reduce the other elements, you have a significant reduction in preventable disease. So uh, what do you reckon? Which is the highest? Which would you be doing? Which of these would you, if you were undertaking these, would you be most likely to die from if you were consistently smoking, taking drugs, uh, drinking alcohol, not exercising, or overeating, uh, or taking high salt, high fat, high sugar diet. So which do you think, one, two, three, or four, which, which, is, which is the order that you would put it? So you're welcome to write in the chat. Let's see if we let's see what uh, everyone thinks. So number two, alcohol, drug use. Number three, physical activity. Number one, smoking. Number four, dietary. Query, query. Yeah. OK, that's pretty good. I think there's someone else typing, so we'll see what they come up with. So we've got slight difference. So low physical activity first, then alcohol, drug use, tobacco, smoke, uh, and then dietary. So diet seems to be lowest for both of you. So we'll have a look. Now, uh, if you can maximise your screen as much as possible, but basically um, alcohol and drug use um, increases your percentage of death across a range of diseases. So basically the um, the bars, the coloured bars identify different um, uh, diseases and uh, ranging from heart disease, liver disease. Cirrhosis is um, uh, 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 liver disease. Uh, and then we've got diabetes, cancers, self-harm and interpersonal violence so um, not that this is good but this data identifies um, uh, not just physical harm as a result of these activities but also um, uh, uh, social cultural mental psychological harm as well and it's important that that's recognized you know people um, you know the fact that people die as a result of self-harm you know significant concerns um, OK, so how did we get on? So alcohol and drug use. Uh, let me just flip back. What number was that? Number two. So uh, one of you's got top marks there. Dietary risk is actually second highest. Tobacco smoke, then the next and lower physical activity. If we just pulled out uh, cardiovascular disease, then we know smoking is the highest risk for cardiovascular disease. So some conditions, the the change, uh, the, the order would be different, but collectively uh, alcohol and drug use uh, are, are the highest uh, in terms of uh, risk factors. And as I say, they're modifiable. Um, uh, so, so people don't have to take alcohol and drugs. Um, but if we look back at those social determinants, that that haloed um, arch approach, you know, if you're living in um, uh, uh, certain socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, if you have, if your if your home life is not necessarily stable, um, if you if you've grown up with people who have uh, alcohol and drug uh, abuse problems, then often that cycle perpetuates. So it. it it's it's complex. It is complex. And then again, some other worrying data is that uh, again, not only do you have a, a lower life expectancy, but if you have serious mental illness, there's also double the risk of obesity. So it's not really the 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 um, uh, the actual 
illness, it's the impact that illness has on that person's lifestyle. So they may work less, they may have a more sedentary lifestyle, they may um, uh, uh, be fearful of going out of the house, uh, etc. They have medication which can change appetite um, and uh, change, you know, desire and interest. Uh, so again, uh, significant risks uh, with, with people who have severe mental illness. So we do know that physical health problems significantly increase poor mental health. So there's there's some there's a group a term called long term conditions. Does anyone know what a long term condition might be? Oops. Can anyone name a long term condition? What's an example of a long term condition? Doesn't matter if you don't know, it's fine. Brilliant. Yes, diabetes is one, heart failure. Sometimes they were called chronic diseases, so you might hear that term as well. But generally, the common term now is uh, long term conditions. So absolutely, diabetes, heart failure, chronic lung disease, uh, significant health problems. And in fact, cancer is often becoming more of a long term condition as well. Um, and then certain infections. So if someone is HIV, then they would be considered to have a long term condition. Um, but as a result of having a long term condition, this person is um, at increased risk of poor mental health. So you're never free from the condition. It might impact on your relationships, on your ability to work or have the job that you want. It might impact on your economics, your uh, your lifestyle. Um, it's going to encroach uh, and sometimes dominate every area of your life. Uh, and clearly, it generally isn't a positive uh, um, uh aspect of your life and therefore you are more likely to to maybe have anxiety particularly around you know uh, uh, issues around treatment uh, if you've experienced poor care or or very painful treatment or very traumatizing or distressing treatment the fact that you're going to have that again next month or every few months you know it really can set up issues around anxiety you're maybe limited, you're maybe isolated, um, again, a uh, high risk of, of depression. So we're looking at around 30% of people with a long term physical health condition. And so as a nurse, when we meet someone uh, who we know has a long term condition, we shouldn't just um, treat them with our knowledge of that condition. We need to also have that concern about, well, has anyone actually checked? Are you displaying signs of depression or are you now exhibiting anxiety? And it might be that this person lives with their condition for many years and then it changes. Uh, it's not that as soon as you get diagnosed, everything else piles on as well. This can be over a period of time. But just people on repeat prescription, the GP knows about them, sets up the pre prescription, they seem to not be getting worse, needing hospital admission, but are they actually slowly getting more depressed, more isolated, uh, and, and no one's actually aware of it. So as nurses, we have a uh, responsibility to engage with people when we meet them, for whatever reason, and just check in with people. So part of what you'll learn is how to assess mental health status as well as physical uh, health as in addition. And then on the opposite side, and we've already sadly seen the, the shocking statistics related to this, if you have mental health problems, absolutely it can exacerbate physical illness uh, and it will affect your outcomes and cost of treatment. Not that that is necessarily our primary concern, but clearly more problems, more treatment, 
uh, does does result in our healthcare system with more costs to the NHS. Um, just as another aside, uh, if you're not aware of the King's Fund, this is a, a it's a public body, it's a charity, but what it does, it's called a think tank and it looks at policy that the government are putting forward. It looks at activity related to healthcare and social care and it's it's brilliant. It's great at distilling um, uh, some of the complexities of healthcare and presenting in a clear way. Uh, it undertakes uh, as a body research and so uh, definitely within our course we will be expecting you to access um, this website and probably directing you to to various activities and resources to read. So it's a, it's a really good helpful resource, the King's Fund, uh, which is where I've got this data from. Um, one of their most recent um, publications, slightly different to this topic, was looking at how to uh, ensure that nurses are compassionate in the care that they give. So um, they are also directing the, the, the profession of nursing uh, as well. But yeah, it's brilliant if you need a sort of snapshot view of healthcare systems, what's working, what's not, what's some good data. Uh, they're very reliable. Uh, in the resource list, there's another um, uh, reference uh, to another website, Health Foundation, which also offers an alternative but equally valid um, uh, information around healthcare. So do do use those. Um, so what a lot of um, I've been talking about is badged in this idea of health inequalities. So it's not right that if someone has mental illness that they have a reduced life expectancy and they have increased risk of becoming obese. That is what's called a health inequality, um, i.e. they are avoidable inequities in health between groups of people in this country and between countries. Um, and what, what it's showing is it's more than just the physical makeup of an individual, their cells, it's about their social and economic circumstances that's really going to impact so if you if you may if you enable people to live safely and healthily in in good accommodation with clean drinking water with with a good family network with good social network with good jobs good education that dramatically shifts people's well-being um, so this is a common image um, about health inequalities and it's called the social gradient. Uh, and basically, sadly, in this country, as well as across the world, people are born into circumstances that tip them either to a more positive um, outcome or a very or a negative. So not everyone, sadly, has a good start in life. Um, not everyone has the education and the capacity and the resources and the finances to have control of their life. Um, can they have access to good or fair employment? Um, do they have a healthy standard of living? And again, COVID has identified some of those discrepancies throughout this country uh, and with certain um, demographic groups, so people who are black or from Asian minority ethnic groups. The other group which you may have been aware of through um, advertising campaigns is those who would be unsafe in their own home. So we were all required to stay at home, but for some people their home was not safe. So nurses were actively working in communities to to try and um, assess and manage risk for people whose home were no longer safe during COVID or actively recruiting and encouraging and supporting black and Asian minority ethnic people to take up the vaccine um, to to um, counter some of the um, false science that, that has been bandied around, particularly around vaccines. So nurses are actively involved in trying to tip the balance and get 
the social gradient more even. Um, I, this slide uh, continues to be um, uh, a concerning north-south divide. So I'm not sure where you live, but if you're if you're in the southeast, you can see that your life expectancy is in around the 80 year mark that's average um, and what I really like about this slide is it also differentiates between healthy life expectancy so um, you can live a long life but how much of that life are you healthy and well so a healthy life expectancy sorry is going to be less but still significantly more than if you live in the northeast and I was looking at data again today just to sort of refresh on this. And it's consistently the same. We are still reporting and we have to report to Public Health England um, data on outcomes of health. And uh, still we're seeing discrepancy. Uh, there's much that's been done to change, but there, and there's loads of initiatives and nurses are actively involved in this. But this data uh, it still exists and sadly it, we haven't really improved so there is a very well known um, report on health inequalities the Marmot Review that's the um, uh, publication on the left of the slides and that was published in 2010 really shocking data about health inequalities and division difference in, in health depending on where you live it set out key objectives to change and challenge those um, disparities we're now 10 years on so that was published 2010 2020 we had we had the new um, and sadly the report shows that people can expect to spend more of their lives in poor health um, and that actually uh, life expectancy has either stalled, so we're not improving life expectancy, or it's even declined for the poorest 10% of women. So we, so actually we, we, we haven't done better. The health gap between people who are wealthy and deprived is, is increasing. And where you live, particularly the northeast, shows that you have a worse off health compared to living even in a deprived area of London. So <laughs> I'd love to uh, maybe should have done a very different taster lecture for you because this isn't particularly um, positive. But what I think it, it highlights is that um, there's there's a real opportunity for nurses to actively engage in in how to address those health inequalities. It challenges me to think ten years on from now. I do not want those statistics to be worse. You know, how can I promote people's health? How can I engage with people? How can I challenge policy that? disadvantages people where is the nurse's voice in saying actually I work actively with people this is what their need is so have a broader view of nursing and the role it's not just dressing wounds uh, and and limited sort of in hospital care it, it's advocating for people and and trying to comp, um, challenge these health inequalities and and this is where nursing will go we we are asking you to be leaders uh, and improvers of of care and you can be involved in this you can work alongside social workers you can work alongside the police to to improve uh, the situation of of people uh, and if you know most people say they want to help they've come into nursing to help well this is where you need to help this is absolutely one of the key areas. So I guess to, to end on some positives, we do know what we can do. There is some great um, research and evidence to show actually this is the solution. Yes, we have to work hard to achieve it, but we know what will positively change to make a really significant and um, effective outcome. So often it's looking at how the well-being of children is achieved and these are some priorities uh, related to that for children uh, and 
to think that these aren't available for all children is very disheartening but we know what can happen uh, and nurses can be great in, in helping advocate and support and, and identify when it's not happening so through something called safeguarding uh, and then um, in terms of um, uh, public health activity there is a range of aims and basically the aim is twofold to increase healthy life expectancy from that you remember from that previous slide and to reduce the differences in life expectancy between communities um, and this is a live um, real-time data set so you can go onto the public health england website again another great website to have as a bookmark uh, on your nursing folder on on your browser um, uh, and you can see again if you really want to show your show um, some data you can see what the differences are with these different outcomes and indicators so we are working towards improving health um, and uh, what's helpful is we're identified by locality so we can really say this is what we need to target uh, we're doing well here but what do we need to focus on so public health england uh, uh, is where nurses will also be actively working um, i pr probably won't do this activity but it's just to highlight within a lecture um, we would sort of often introduce activities to help reinforce the learning uh, and uh, with this it would be an activity to sort of work in groups uh, and uh, we would give you the, the website or expect you to look for the website uh, related to these the public health outcomes framework and you can use the data and information from that to help answer the question so um, uh, sometimes we start with activities like this, um, but often we will be putting in activities to reinforce uh, key elements or key uh, messages or aspects just to help uh, with um, your literacy to, to be able to access resources as well and just to um, test out your knowledge, your learning uh, and help you identify areas where you feel you need more. And then the, the great thing with group work is that you sort of gain more learning from the collective approach that, that might be taken. So that's kind of uh, uh, the, the, the rationale for, for activities, as well as the slightly more sort of fun engagement activities that we um, tried out earlier in, in the session. Uh, so again, this was the plan of the session. So we looked at what mental health uh, and physical health means uh, and illness, what influences uh, particularly mental and physical illness and the relationship between the two uh, and focusing on the uh, uh, inequalities that, that, that can be um, present uh, um, for, for someone uh, in terms of their physical and mental health. Generally, uh, we should provide you with the resources. Uh, so the references that we've used, uh, we're very keen within this course to present the evidence to support um, your understanding. Uh, and uh, often uh, we will have a separate reading list for you to also access. Um, we would expect you to check out the links that are there to, to support you. A lot of the resources will be electronic and web based. So I would say quite accessible uh, and, and easy to work through. Um, and then if there's any additional resources as well, we would also um, add that for you. So I hope that's a helpful flavour for you of the um, the way we would like to conduct lectures and the expectations of you to prepare and how you would work through the lecture yourself. Um, generally, we wouldn't be teaching for much more than um, you know an hour at most and then breaks uh, and activities throughout to help um, help you sort of filter through your learning and then often what people will do is after the lecture they'll maybe um, review their notes maybe 
restructure them or highlight areas that they particularly want to um, uh, focus on. If we have a key lecture that's related to an assignment, uh, then we might direct you to uh, literature or you might then after that lecture sort of just work more on your assignment preparation and use that lecture as a base. Um, where we can, we'll record them so you can also play back. And I think that's one of the advantages now of these sessions uh, through Teams. So you can uh, uh, make use of it uh, again and again. Uh, and a, a lot of uh, students do benefit from that. So we, we like to sort of make that uh, available. Always, most of our lectures are very approachable, I hope, and we'd be happy to take questions throughout the session or questions at the end. So uh, I'll offer that to you now if anyone's got any questions or comments for the, for the, for the lecture. But I hope that was a, a combination of what we teach, how we teach and uh, uh, what, how we would ask for you to work with us in, in that approach. And thank you very much. Appreciate your your comments and interactions. So thank you. So if anyone does have any comments or queries, do do ask. Well, thank you. That was really insightful. Appreciate that. Thank you. OK, well, I shall leave you to it. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Uh, so great question. What kind of support is available for students, especially within the first few weeks of the course? So you will um, benefit from what's called a welcome week or an induction week. So we would give you a flavour of the course coming up as well as signpost you to some of the key resources and support that would be available to you. Um, so that would be uh, one element of the support. We would also um, allocate you to uh, an academic advisor. So that's uh, someone you would have a one to one relationship with for the whole of the three years. And we would expect them to meet with you early, hopefully within the first couple of weeks um, so that they can um, introduce themselves and develop a relationship with you to help with your development on the course. And that would be a good opportunity for you to sort of um, uh, raise any queries or concerns that you might have. Generally, the support services will be really visible in that initial part of the, the term. Uh, so that's the university support services and um, we would be, uh, you know, advertising them and making sure that you're fully aware. So the support is varied. It can be from um, the so social support and getting you integrated as, as a group and socialising and, and uh, uh, making friends. Then the initial lectures will be um, sort of stepping stones to help you um, get used to the um, the intranet system, so how you find information, where it is, uh, how you access things, induction to the library, that sort of thing. So some of it's about your academic study. Um, and then uh, really in between that, you know, if you're feeling a little bit vulnerable, you're not sure, then it would be student services, your academic advisor. We don't for nursing have the benefit of year two and year three students you would be students first off but um, in the future we would have year two and year three students also budging up and being available so um, we know it's it's a new uh, vulnerable time for, for students uh, so particularly in that first few weeks we'll be gearing up um, helping you um, get used to um, university life uh, and um, hopefully enjoying it and being excited and, and not feeling overwhelmed. Um, is there anything particular you were thinking you might have a concern about? I don't know if you felt able to suggest anything. It's a very valid question. Great. Good. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. I, 
I hope you feel reassured. We would we would absolutely want to support students, um, uh, and um, and because we'll be, we we would be a, a small cohort, it would be you know we'll get really get to know you by name, and um, you know if you're not there, we'd know that sort of thing. It wouldn't be you wouldn't be lost, which I think is important. Any other questions or comments at all? Thank you for joining today. Lovely. OK, well, if it's all right, I'll, I'll stop the recording now. And again, thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, if you do have any queries, you can contact the admissions team, um, admissions at chai.ac.uk, uh, and I'm sure there's other resources uh, through the application service as well, uh, UCAS or through us as a university. So we'll keep in contact with you, um, but do be in contact with us as you need. So again, thank you very much and um, appreciate your time. Bye bye.